let's get into it, dude. Let's do it. I want to talk about your life, everything to do with you, dude. I want to get to know you as a person. <laughs> let's get into it. Let's go hard at this because <laughs> it's deep and it could lead us into some uncomfortable places, but let's try. Well, you've had an interesting career. You've done, you've done a lot of really cool things in the tech community, you've been a part of a lot of companies. What was like your first start in the industry? Yeah. Um, so I'll actually just go back a little bit since we're taking the time. I grew, back, up in, yeah, I grew up in Alaska, not thinking I'm at gonna all. I'm going to write your biography after <laughs> this conversation. I hope. This, I hope that this is a whole plan for you to be the ghostwriter <laughs> <laughs> of my autobiography. Um, but yeah, I grew up in Alaska, not thinking about entrepreneurship or tech at all. Yeah. It's more like Just thinking about when the sun's going to come out. It's survival. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which like in the winter, you know, I li- where I lived for seven years, it didn't come out all Doesn't winter long. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually have a lot of friends up there living the subsistence lifestyle. Like, you know, really that's their job is to hunt and fish and that kind of thing. Are they way happier than you? It seems like it. Yeah. <laughs> they might be onto something. Guaranteed they're happier than but I am. But then it's really hard when it's a tough hunt, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. There are <laughs> higher stakes um, than like when I go on a fishing <laughs> trip or whatever. But um, I came down to school to BYU and I got a job at this little startup company. It was called uh, Digis Wireless High Speed Internet. It's a tiny team when Heck I joined yeah. there. And then they started to grow like crazy. And I went on a mission to the Czech Republic, came back. I joined them again and they'd done acquisitions and they became from this little tiny crew the largest wireless internet service provider in the country and that's like when a light bulb went on for me i thought that i was going to study history and go to law school because i'd had brothers that had done that and i was like that doesn't sound nearly as fun as trying to build a business and and it was also this realization that was super uh, i was super fortunate to get that early in my career that the people that build these really successful companies are just normal people Mm-hmm. We're just solving one problem after another. And so I, I got into doing some startup things while in college. And then when I graduated, I started my first company all on my own called Fit Marketing. Mm-hmm. So it was a. Oh, yeah, I remember yeah, Fit. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, we still got some Fit swag out there. I see it every once in a while in oh, the yeah. wild. Makes me happy. But that was a. Originally, it was like a CMO for hire business. And then as we grew, we became an early inbound marketing agency so an early partner of hubspot Mm -hmm. marketo tech companies like that and uh, then i started to i mean my whole career is just uh you know for for better or for worse uh, a series of naive choices you know (laughs) like i didn't know that actually if you wanted to drive enterprise value like how much a company is worth agencies aren't the first place to yeah (laughs) start yeah i learned that lesson too yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you, like journalism, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I Zenny, yeah. like yeah. you saw well, yeah, This is cool, guys. You guys are all making enormous companies. <laughs> yeah. This is cool. Yeah. Happy to have helped. Right. <laughs> I And I love that. I love the business. I love the <laughs> relationships, the creative challenge that was there. But then there is this feeling of like, man, are we building mansions that we don't get to live in? Like we yeah. help along the way. And then at some point, you know, these companies would take off and be acquired and then they would go maybe have a different partner. And so um, I I later had a partner come on that was really awesome with that and we sold it. And that's when I thought, like, I want to get into the world of tech. And so uh, I was an early um, member of the team at Quizzer. Mm-hmm. Yes, we grew that, which, you know, I got to say. was so cool. <laughs> it had a run, didn't it? Quizzer was it, freaking cool. We got, we got, I, I, I will never forget the little startup of the year award at the early start fest. Oh, yeah. What an honor yeah. that was. I just rigged it for you, honestly. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that was, I mean, I felt like we actually had a lot of things going for us. You were the startup of the year. It Quizzer was, cool. was way cool. It was cool. And really talented people in this product that would allow um, big brands or big publishers to get interactive content on their site. So we had some wild experiences like, uh, I'll never forget the night. I was actually out at a conference in New York and the leadership team of Gawker, who mm-hmm. company that no longer exists, yeah. uh, but they were big in their day too. They were there with me at the concert, or sorry, at the conference. And that night they put up the quiz do you remember, like, is it white and gold or blue and black dress? Mm-hmm. They put that up on Gawker, and it took off, like, just... On Quizzer. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a Quizzer, Quizzer quiz yeah. that they put up, and they said, which color is this dress? And I started getting calls at my hotel from the leadership team saying, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened in the history of our company. 
if that product goes down, I will kill you. <laughs> and, it, and, and like, it didn't sound like a joke. Like, I'm in, I'm in New York. I'm thinking. Well, and, what could you do about yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> Anything is possible. You're so, like, I'm in a hotel room. Right <laughs> so, so I'm calling back. The team in Lehigh comes in. They're all, like, spinning up every server they can yeah. and working super hard. And w- there was this great moment because we, we were getting 50,000 unique visitors a second hitting that thing. And um, their site actually went down, and our application, which was embedded in the site, was still loading. That's cool. Felt great to send them that screenshot. Um, but that that was a really cool thing to realize how a technology product can go around the world and touch so many people. It it was crazy. Just a few years in, I remember uh, we hit in one year over 350 million people who interacted with the platform because ESPN was embedding it, Red Bull. BuzzFeed wasn't Bu- well, well, so BuzzFeed actually built their own. They were one of the few that did. New York Times built their own, but we had NBC, you guys Yahoo. On. Well, they were pretty good. Don't be <laughs> shy about it, dude. <laughs> they were pretty good. They did the, you know, they let out with the Which Disney Princess Are You quizzes, and that whole genre did a lot of work for us. So I, I got to give them credit for that. But Quizzer was super fun. I was there for three years, and I decided to step down, thinking I would take a sabbatical, and start something new. Yeah. And after some travel and thinking about it, and I had ideas in mind, I talked to the leadership team at Lucid Software. Uh-huh. And uh, Kickstart was an investor in both Quizzer and in Lucid Software. And they had said, this is such a well-run company. I knew some of the people already, so I thought that. But I, I had so many positive um, sort of inclinations about Lucid Software when I went there. And then what they said is, hey, we're, we're in a spot as a company we're really excited about, and we have this product and a division, and rather than starting something new, why don't you come run that as, as like an entrepreneur inside of the Lucid Software ecosystem? That was Lucid Press, and so in 2017, I joined as the general manager there. And part of what I was so excited about is I'd had these other entrepreneurial experiences, and I mentioned, like, and not out of some faux humility, but literally just not knowing what I was doing at so many of these junctures, mm-hmm. thinking, it would be really good for me to take a ride with a company that's super well run, mm-hmm. learn about that next phase of growth with super talented people. And I got to say, Lucid was that and more. It was just I, I super admire the team there. Uh, Dave Groh was the president when I started there. He's the CEO now. Carl Sun was the CEO. Now he's the chairman of the board. They were awesome. Mm-hmm. Everyone, Ben Diltz, co-founder, oh, yeah. just phenomenal, talented people and a really great leadership team. So we, we went on this run and ultimately I decided from from my perspective, and fortunately, you know, the board was uh, in agreement that Lucid Press would be better off independent. Mm-hmm. So we spun that out in 2021, made it independent, um, and then in 2022 we rebranded to Mark. So we, we funded the business while we M A R Q. M A R Q. That's right. Yep. Mark. dot com. M A R Q. And that's that's what is keeping me busy all the time now, and I still love it. So that you know, I first got involved in 2017 so it's been a little while now what do you think makes a company like lucid successful that um challenges something like quizzer because they both yeah and i don't want to get into the like we can talk higher up than like you know specific things because quizzer was this incredible company um that had this incredible product but it just stayed like this feature yeah right yeah and what i think has been fascinating about lucid is it started as a feature as well we're going to do diagrams yep Right. Yep. It's like, okay, so the moment Adobe adds that to their repertoire or their suite of things, it's over, right? Lucid, you know, understanding, like having some foresight, it's like, no, we're going to compete with Adobe. Yeah. I remember writing some sort of story like that back in the day. I was like, Lucid's going to take down Adobe. I remember, remember, like, literally, that was a headline that I have something I wrote because I loved Lucid and I loved Carl and the team and Ben and yeah and Dave and stuff and and I was like man this is really cool cuz cuz they were like one of these companies that had this really incredible loyal fan base for a very specific product right and when they managed to like build a whole platform on top of that how were they able to do that in a way that like so many companies and I'm not just talking about the ones that have been great and have not worked out and things like that I mean that this is very common that it's very hard to go from like a really great feature or yeah. even like product into a platform yeah it is because you want to be a platform totally a totally and and I mean that's what investors will talk about all the time if mm-hmm. you're looking at getting you know if you're either looking at getting funding or 
even more so maybe acquired by a private equity or growth equity group, they're going to be saying, is this a platform or not? And they'll have their different definitions of that. But basically, it's like, are you going to be the thing? It's a platform that other products are added to, or are you going to be one that's added to others? And so a few things about Lucid Software from my perspective. And I think I would love to hear what all of the founders say about this, and they might all have different perspectives on it. But one is Ben is an incredible engineer. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't think that that story is told often enough about like how talented Ben Diltz is. You know, uh, he, he built it originally and then co-founded with Carl. But he also was building a product that came that, that like the timing was just so good because with what uh, was available with technology then in the cloud with Google Chrome and other things like they were able to build a product that frankly was better than what state of the art th than what Visio was mm -hmm. doing which is a sleepy product in the Microsoft Office suite mm -hmm. doing diagrams and flowcharts so first of all they had a product that I think was it was just different and better think like a lot of Google Docs like features so collaborative and in the cloud and re really snappy they just built a great product so that that was first and another thing about Lucid Story that's different than a lot of Utah based companies which tend to get pretty sales oriented quite fast mm -hmm. is Carl came from a background of being early at Google mm -hmm. he 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 doesn't like people talking about this but he had two master's degrees in engineering you know an engineer in many ways you know, at heart. I don't like talking about that either <laughs> but oh, some brainiac two Ka master's Ka degrees Carl doesn't like any <laughs> any shine he like I've told him I told him one time in a meeting I was like Carl maybe you should get an agent he's like I don't want an agent he doesn't need people to know that he you know got his law degree from Harvard and his two ma two master's degrees of, in engineering from MIT he's a he's he a is genius. he's he brilliant. ran Google in China right he did he did yeah. and so he was early there he had k at google.com as mm -hmm. his uh, email address he was that that early but he um, he was really focused on how to build an awesome product, like more so than I think most companies in our ecosystem, frankly, more so than Quizzer, if you l look mm -hmm. at those things. And I, I've often thought, honestly, that if Quizzer would have had, and I say this being one of the leadership mm -hmm. team members at Quizzer, I think if we would have had the Lucid Software mentality, that company would have gone a lot farther. Because you, you, had, you had this outstanding... Um, user experience, which they understood. They were building for a market that they knew at first because it was a lot of technical um, users and engineers. Mm -hmm. and, and so they, they were nailing that. And then they brought in one of the great geniuses of our ecosystem in Dave Grow mm -hmm. to uh, build a go-to-market motion. Another intelligent, uh, intelligent man. Just like out of control, yeah. smart, actually. And, you know, and, and a phenomenal person, really great to work with. But what he built was this engine that was a land and expand motion. So they would get people to sign up online. And then, you know, you'd have all these users in a company. And then someone like Dan Cook, who was a great leader there as well on the go-to-market mm -hmm. side, sales leader for a long time um, there, they, they, would, they would be able to call into these accounts and say, hey, well, you already have 50 users on the platform. It'd be a lot better for security, you know, for control, um, for collaboration to put this under one roof. And so they, they built this great like distribution model. There's this old cliche, right? That first time founders think about product and second time founders think about distribution. I think Lucid had both. They, mm -hmm. they, they were product focused first and they got really smart on distribution. But ultimately they, they learned that the use case of diagramming and flow charting can be so much more. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just, th there's actually tons of apps that do really lightweight diagram and flow charting, but they were built to be connected into all kinds of systems of records. So you can actually see your account mapping if you're a sales team, or you can see your org chart if you're an HR team, or you can see how your systems are scaling up if you're an engineer connected to, you know, AWS or you know, Amazon Web Services, that kind of thing. So like th there, there was a lot of depth to mm -hmm. the product that made it a platform and not a feature. And I also think they benefited, frankly, in some ways from a space that was not getting as much attention. Yeah. There was one point in time I remember when I, I was stunned to hear that Lucid Chart had more integrations with Microsoft than uh, their own the Visio th than Visio did. Yeah. That, you know, because Microsoft's also like, yeah, great, this is an awesome yeah. product, our customers want it. And so I think there, those are some of the factors. I think even the Lucid Software team would say they didn't know how, they weren't always sure how big it could become. And it's, you know, it's just in the cloud 100. Yeah. It's one of the great like SaaS software companies that 
has ever it's existed. Enormous, and that space is enormous. I mean, yeah. look at what's coming out of that space. I don't mean to mention a competitor, but um, Canvas. Well, Canva. Canva, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Figma. Yeah. And that whole world of collaborative yep. back end tools, either design or figure. I mean, it's it's huge. It's enormous. It's it's massive. So I think that they did a and lot. Yeah, of, who would have thought that would be big? Back yeah, then? yeah, yeah. And I, I so I think there's always some element of luck in this stuff, um, but they got that and they had a product that people would come back and use really frequently. And then that juxtaposition with Quizzer that was tough is you would get actually bursts of activity that were astounding. We'd have case studies of like a e-commerce company that would drive five million dollars in sales off a of quiz, but even their use would be episodic. Like they mm-hmm. would want to run a campaign and then they're like, well, wait, why are we buying this for, for the year? And, you know, I think that there, uh, there were ways we could have grown that business to get to a better place. But that being said, well, it's hard um, to be a platform. Yeah. It's really, really hard to be a platform. It doesn't happen often. That's right. And even the best teams and companies and products, you know, that that's a hard pun. I mean, like where does Quizzer even go in retrospect? You try to be like a content, uh, management platform maybe at some point maybe you start competing with like a WordPress and Ghost and like these there's, types of things. There's these type forms. You yeah, know, type really form became pretty big. Uh, like y- you have groups like SurveyMonkey and Qualtrics mm-hmm. who then you rolled were in th- that space. It, well, then they rolled out quizzes as the feature <laughs> because it's that became a lot bigger, you know, way to collect data. And that that was the I think most interesting thing about Quizzer is it was really good at driving engagement, but you could actually meaningfully um, get to know people through that. And then, and then, for example, create Facebook groups. Like mm-hmm. the, the really savvy marketers got way more value out of Quizzer than we ever charged them for. Mm-hmm. And then some people probably didn't get, you know, nearly as much as they yeah. sort of could have. Yeah, Typeform would have been a direction to go in for sure. So yep. Something like that. Yeah, Qualtrics. Qualtrics is absurd, though. That whole story is absurd. It's like, uh, you know, start with surveys and like, then I'm just going to create a category called experience management. And now we're worth eight billion and I'm going to go public and take it private and go again and do again. Like, let's just keep doing it. Yep. Let's just keep making eight billion dollars every time. It's like how how big is of an apple must it be to get that many bites? from it but i i mean it's huge, not huge, done yet either huge credit I, yeah. I i love it i love that story i one thing that i think about sometimes in our space is i in in our, in our state is i hope we don't like fall into the trap of eating our own too much yeah i feel like that that can happen when we're in this phase where we've gotten to a next level of maturity from where we were when i started my first company i felt like i didn't even, there was there even funding in the state i don't know yeah and now it's it's everything has changed. Last thing I looked at, we would get over thirty billion dollars of funding in Utah in a year. Yeah. In this tech world, it's the biggest part of the economy, it's the fastest growing part of the economy. I mean, even with some of the headwinds, you know, that we've had, it's it's just so substantial. But I feel like there becomes this this sense among some that we got to take these people down a notch. And I'm not saying we need to to worship or idolize any person or company mm-hmm. either. But man, I. I feel so grateful for these other companies that have been wildly successful in our ecosystem and in, in the silico, Silicon Slopes ecosystem because it really does matter. I'm out like raising money yeah. and people say, oh yeah, well, you know so-and-so and I know their company. Yeah, and those people will either give a reference or just the fact that they know where we are and we're on the map. Yeah. It's also just counterproductive. Yeah. More, more than anything, like say you don't like a personality or you don't like... You know, whatever, whatever it is. Yep. Um, sure. Like and it, to me, like part of it's really weird that we get talked about yeah. outside. <laughs> like that we get talked <laughs> about at all. It freaks me out still. It's yeah. really just like a strange phenomenon for me. Like um, and probably for everyone. Yeah. In, I mean, it's probably weird for you too. like like this is a thing. This is a topic of conversation at dinner tables. It's yep. the weirdest thing ever. Um, so it, but it's counterproductive. Like if you're in this space and you're known as someone who actively kind of brings down the most successful, and I don't want to say brings down, but it attempts to disparage, maybe might be a better way to to, to phrase it, those who have gone before and been like really successful as though they didn't, one, earn it, two, the style you don't like, three, the, I mean, whatever it is, you go down the list, whatever it is, that's like pointless. And by the way, those people don't care. Nobody cares. 
Well, and and I think the there, there's the flip side to that, right? Which is like, it's okay to not like it, and it's okay to choose to do something different and have a different style. Like I think Carl is an example of somebody who's fascinating because of his difference in style. If he, and now he's the chairman of the board at Lucid, but longtime CEO, right, co-founder. I mean, he, his personality was just so different. He was not looking to be out in front. He was not looking to be super. Yeah, I gave him CEO visible. of the year one year, and he didn't show up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Craziest that's, thing ever. That sounds, that sounds that's, right. How cool is that? That, that, that checks out. That's actually uh, way cool. It's like when Bob Dylan went to, <laughs> he won like some sort of, uh, what is it? The Presidential Medal of Freedom or something yeah. like that. He didn't show up. He didn't let Obama put it on. <laughs> he just didn't even show up. That's crazy. I mean, not comparing us to like that big of an award, but like. He was the CEO of the year at the Silicon Slopes Hall of Fame, right? Like, he's like, oh, pass. Couldn't make it. <laughs> but, you know. Th- By the way, it's not. He apologized. Like, the, 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 there's, there's all kinds of different ways to do it. And I think choose the best. And, and certainly there sometimes are examples in our ecosystem of, like, behavior that is really just not okay. And and, and we re- got to recognize that and, and yeah. be better and lift, you know lift up people who who are doing great things and help each other when when someone's falling down if we can to, to get to a better path but it's just like yeah i hope i hope we can um stay grateful for uh what we have here and and also like um yeah because there's like crazy things i mean when you have like crazy emails being sent yeah <laughs> oh and like we're front page news and all that type That's of tough. stuff, it's not great. But we've also got to remember that we're all just human beings. Yeah. And there is something about forgiveness, cutting slack. There is something about like, I don't want to, you know, spend my life disparaging someone else. Yeah. Or pointing out worst moments of their life or things like that. Like, and like, all, and all of that, then it's still true that those things are awful. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think right. that like both of those things are true. Totally. Right. But like, I think we spend a little bit too much time, all not just in our community, but general in society, just trying to tear each other down and really like belaboring it. You know, it, like, it, isn't that weird? We love the write up. Yeah. The, oh, this yeah. Journey. The, you get up and then we love to, you know, then find ways to. Well, and what's interesting, too, I mean, like down. it or not, like if you're in this industry now and have joined it in the next like in the past like 10 years, you're standing on their shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> Like the, this industry doesn't exist without him. It's just a fact in the same way that the industry doesn't exist without Alan Ashton and Bruce Bastian That's right. and that and John Warnock, who we just lost. And they were everybody stands on the shoulders of someone. One hundred percent, I think. And there's so much from that generation, which we kind of gets forgotten about with this next iteration. But that's that's the foundation. Absolutely. Of all this. And I, I guess for me, I just feel so grateful about it because I show up from Alaska you know, yeah. step in to this realm and right as we were hitting the upswing and then have had so many great investors, um, leaders, mentors. And I, I'll, I'll say that, too, about about our community, like people are very multifaceted. I've had and, and I'm not saying then just because of my experience, then that projects to anybody else. I'm just saying I have been so grateful for people like Jeremy Andrus, mm-hmm. who had no reason to really be as kind of a mentor as he's been to me. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've been with him and not in, in a ton of circumstances, but in enough where I'm kind of like, man, you really probably don't have time to be talking to me right now. Like you shouldn't be, you know, supporting me the way that you are and helping me to think about how to be a better CEO. And, but, but I I hope that we can keep that. And, you know, I think we do too. Like, like, um, you know, the Jeremy's, the Ryan's, the Sconnerts, the Todd's of the world. I mean, go down the list of the, like, these incredible leaders. You know, they just want to help. Like, how cool is it that our biggest tech win ever in, in Ryan is throwing all that back into Utah? He's buying the freaking Jets. He's like, wh- why would he? I, I don't know. I can't honestly say that I would care about the state of Utah if I sold my company for $8 billion. I can't honestly Where say Where would that. you be, Clint? <laughs> you know? I'm not sure I'd still be here, right? Like, I'm not sure. Like, 
I like to think I would. I like to think yeah. I have that in my like I'm Utah through and through Utah until death. But I don't know. Like and yeah. nobody knows until you're in that position and what a great position and privileged position it is to be in. But but my word, that guy is changing the state in ways that no one else ever has in in its history. Right. Well, and another thing that's fascinating. Same about, with Jeremy. Jeremy's yeah, doing the same thing. I yeah, mean, all these guys are brought, brought the company here. Another thing to realize too is, it 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 actually is an odd breed of person often frankly who can figure out how to change something and bring something new to the world and you know man founder ceos odd bunch yeah. of people and i say that with affection but like to your point about you know some room for forgiveness like i i, I certainly feel twinges of things where i'm like in any number of settings with our tech community it's funny because i interface with our tech community and some with our political community too and think about like the group of egos that we can <laughs> you know assemble <laughs> with those people like that but but that's that's part of it you know yeah. like hey people are I, I think by and large here there's so many people. welcome to life go to an industry and show me that's like yeah. it's like perfect and everyone in it is perfect and these are all like perfect human beings with no flaws we're flawed human beings just you know rise above it yeah yeah i, I actually this a buddy of mine who he does stand-up routines talks about bird watching a lot and his line is, he's like, it's a great, great space, but a lot of egos. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, you find it everywhere, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm, I got to say, I'm grateful. And I hope that, you know, there, there may be some who feel um, left out from that, especially as the ecosystem has gotten bigger. Mm -hmm. And it is harder. There's more layers in between. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I remember for no reason is for anything that I'd done as well, but just being in rooms where it's like, wow, like I'm hearing, you know, Ryan talk about how this deal went down with SAP and giving all the details and like, this is fascinating. And I think as we've gotten bigger and there's been these bigger successes, there's, there's more gaps, but I hope that we are trying really, really hard. I see a lot of people doing this to make capital accessible to people from every background mm -hmm. and walk of life that, that there's mentorship available in these accelerator programs. Like while there's maybe more layers and levels to our ecosystem, I think there's also a ton more resources and, and I hope more for everyone to feel like they can find their place here. Just yeah. being, bring your great self, your talent. And I think about like, you know, I'm, I'm connected to a couple of VC firms. I think they do a great job. We're getting like just more and more, um, elements of a community that, that are inclusive and, and boy, not to like say mission accomplished, long ways to go, but. No, we need to th focus on as access to opportunity. That's absolutely true. There are like the more successful you become as an ecosystem, the more roadblocks that, I mean, it doesn't just end. I mean, yeah. the more rain cl cloud you create as you uh, get a storm brewing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and well, so and then they start and the economic environment changes and you see yeah. people go through different seasons as well yeah I mean, it's wild yeah it's wild and like yeah and again we're just human beings at the end of the day it's just all human beings doing this uh and so yeah there, there's lots of work to do particularly in the funding side i mean the funding is still like less than one percent women i mean like all all of yeah like all of that like when we talk about access to opportunity and like at the end of the day like what is seen publicly i mean ryan was building Qualtrics for 14 years before anybody knew who ryan smith was yep. or who Qualtrics was yep Right. So it starts pretty early. That's right. <laughs> right. On like who gets these chances. Yeah. Who gets to take these opportunities? Who gets the resources and backing and the people believing in them when no one should? Because right. really no one ever should. Yeah. And it's pretty magical when it happens. Right. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we, we have a lot of work to do and also in the VC area. And I know that they're all doing their best. And um, the area of like these CEOs reaching back and, but you know, all things considered, we're pretty lucky. Why do you care so much about the state of Utah though? Cause this is another thing I want to talk to you about because you got me engaged in politics and it, with not, John, not enough yet. Still yeah, trying to get that with John bets Curtis. 24 bets, 28. <laughs> Tell me when we can run the campaign. Let's and get it going. Just, just what I just said in the past 10 minutes. Counts me. <laughs> um, so John Curtis, yeah. He's mayor of Provo. We both love him. Yeah. I remember this. I think you were working at Quizzer at the time. Yeah. Or so, somewhere That's right. in, in that. And like, man, it'd be cool if this guy was a congressman. Somehow you and a group convince him um, to run. He runs. And that was kind of my first, like, 
And I wasn't even involved. I mean, you were super. I was not even involved. I think I came around every once in a while and said, what are you guys doing here? You guys have packets? I'm there. You guys are trying to give me a packet. Well, I'm not taking a packet. It's crazy. Like, no, this is what you do. Yeah, we need signatures. <laughs> we need cash, fundraising. Well, you know, I'm not going to yeah. do any of that, but can I just like sit in, talk to you guys? There's a lot of great strategy. <laughs> you gave a lot of great strategic <laughs> insights. <laughs> so uh, what was your, was that kind of your first experience in politics as well? Yeah, I don't know that I've unpacked this much in, in any public forum, but there are a few points I look back on and remember how I've interfaced with that world. One, I've always been interested in it. Like I mentioned, I started out in college studying history. Mm-hmm. I was fascinated by this idea of persuasion, what convinces people to do things. And then I, I served a mission in the Czech Republic, and you can't help but be overwhelmed by history there because they've been overrun by history with mm-hmm. you know, what happened at the start of World War II. Um, in particular, where the Nazis came over and took them over bef- really before the rest of everything else got going full bore, but they felt terribly betrayed there. Then they were taken over by the, the communists out of the Soviet Union, and, and they, they, it's hard. Mm-hmm. They've experienced very hard things, and you realize you know, being there with people who have lost family members, who have had all kinds of difficult, challenging experiences in their family history, like how important... Um, the, your your state, your government, your constitution, things like that mm-hmm. become. And so I remember caring about that, mostly focused on the business world and just on a drive one day thinking like, it's a little sad to me that there's, I don't even know who to talk to about this stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I have ideas around this, but I don't know who to talk to. And so when I sold a company, mm-hmm. I started getting invited to political events. Yeah. And and I thought that they wanted to hear my ideas because, like, boy, I got ideas. Yeah. Zero interest. <laughs> yeah, like, man, we got the ideas. Do you have the money? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> I, like, had my little <laughs> notebook of ideas, literally, like, coming in, like, opening it up, like, well, there's a few things I thought we could talk about. And they're like, yeah, dude. Have you ever heard of the flat tax? <laughs> Raise a hand. Nine, nine, nine. I mean, I was like, hey, whatever. Let's talk about some stuff, you know? And I, I was so disappointed, honestly, in my first forays into that realm. Right. And then I started looking for people who were different and who I felt like were there for whole different reasons, had a different skill set. And um, John Curtis totally stood out to me. I'd already known him. When he ran for Provo, I actually created this odd little Facebook page that led for a while that said, who cares who Provo's next mayor will be? Because I thought, like, it doesn't matter. These people, mm-hmm. they're not changing anything. They're not engaging with the, with the student population, which is where I came from. And I, I remember I would ask, like, why don't they care about some basic things like the horrendous uh, predatory parking, that have, you know, enforcement that happens in Provo? These are, these are big that. winners. That yeah. crazy. <laughs> you couldn't park anywhere without getting, like, towed or booted. And uh, John Curtis came in. He I actually got it. About that. He, he got it. He changed Provo in such a meaningful way. Yeah. Had, and, and I felt like he got the business world with his business background. But I mean, he had over a 90 percent approval rating as the mayor of Provo. Oh, well, he's fantastic. He was accessible and everything started changing the way it felt to be downtown. And so uh, I, I felt like, well, if you're in the business community and you're having some success, you got to look around and think, OK, what makes it possible to do what you're doing, then also like to raise a family. Mm-hmm. And you, I, I started to get this feeling of like, it's interesting, we always talk about, you know, how quickly you maybe like fail fast in the, in the startup world. Cause like if, if it's not gonna work, you know, you can figure that out and get to the next thing or pivot. But like, we can't let our state fail. We got mm-hmm. one of them mm-hmm. and we can't let our country fail. Like the, and not only do we have one, only one, but you know, I'm a, a big believer that the U.S. is the the greatest nation that we've ever had. That's you know, with all of our flaws that are like, yeah, frankly, obvious and well documented. That still, mm-hmm. the, this idea that that the founders came together with this is like the most important thing that's happened in man's relation to man in the world for how we organize ourselves and keep each other safe and we get to protect our God-given rights and, and that kind of thing. So it's like, man, we better be involved there. And I kept thinking then how to innovate in that space, being the startup mindset. And it's so hard to structurally change things. (laughs) And so I basically, after banging my head against that for a while, I thought, well, maybe can we just find the best possible people to do it? And that's what led to John Curtis is I thought there was, you know, how could we get someone like that in Congress? Uh So I started recruiting him. I built a website with some friends that was like pledging donations if he would run for Congress, which he was, I think, a little bit embarrassed about. I have this great email that he sent me, and it's it's odd because it came on April 1st, I remember, which was weird. It's like, is this April Fool's? Are you serious? But 
he told me, he's like, hey, it's been nice talking with you about this idea of running for Congress, but we've decided there's a 0.0001% chance that we will ever do that. And so, you know, I gave him the dumb and dumber line back, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, you know, and, and kept talking to him to say like, but we don't get to vote for people like you. Mm -hmm. And then there was a special election where he had a chance to run. And, and what he said was, hey, Owen, there's a lot of people that will like talk about supporting someone in politics. But the truth is when it comes down to running and actually getting the help that you need, you turn around and there's no one there. No one's there. No one's there. And so if you're, I, what I would say to anyone who's interested in getting involved is like, it turns out just showing up and saying, I'm here to help, you can make a huge difference, mm -hmm. you know, and just apply whatever your skill set is. Turns out if you, like we had, I don't know, if you know Daniel Blake? Like this mm -hmm. is a super talented uh, entrepreneur in the area. He, he started Eco Scraps mm -hmm. and he'd sold it. And I was just helping with John Curtis's campaign in 2017. And I saw this volunteer, like, note come in. Hey, I'd be happy to help out with the campaign. Is Daniel Blake? I knew who he was. This is like a very successful yeah. entrepreneur. And so I immediately called because this is not, it's like, okay, well, you get people fill out these forms, but hey. And I said, how much time do you have? And he's like, well, I've had an exit probably like, I don't know, 40 hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> and he was incredible. That's he so showed cool. up. He's like, yeah, you know, and, and people had asked me like, well, what it's in it. For me, I like keeping that as a pretty pure space, meaning like there's all kinds of people that need to be involved to make a political system work. And I value and value them. And, and some of them, I think maybe are grifters, but whatever, <laughs> you know, there's, yeah. there's, there's a mix of people you need to have to make any political system work. But uh, for me, what's, what's awesome is to be in the zone of like, I'm going to show up and volunteer and donate to who I care about. And I'm going to say what I think. And then if they don't like it, that's great. Cause I can just, yeah. I, I'd like to just build my business. That's, that's yeah. what I really want to do. And that keeps it like, fresh and fun and not where you kind of feel like you need to always be guarding what you say because you really want to get somewhere it's like yeah. whatever i'm just here because of the love of can you still do, do that though because you're a figure now i mean um, you're like you got you were in instrumental in curtis instrumental in cox i mean you're you're in it now, man. You're I, you're the establishment. You're who everybody's <laughs> marching against. It's there. <laughs> Let me come. That is, I did I did have this moment like a while back where someone was like talking about the establishment, and I was like, yeah. And then they're kind of looking at me like, hey, well, you well, know, talking about you. you. These are these are your friends. <laughs> I'm like, no, wait a minute. <laughs> I wasn't trying to become the establishment. When did that happen? But um, I have tried to pres preserve a lane for myself to just say what I want to and think about things mm -hmm. and the reality is like you have if you're going to do that you have to realize you can live with the consequences yeah and so i try to make it very clear that while i have friends in that realm i don't speak on behalf of them mm -hmm. and they don't speak on behalf of me and there's people that i support who i won't agree with everything that they do because i want to be able to say whatever it is that i think and then let mm -hmm. the chips fall it is it is a little complicated though is our business has gotten bigger and as our environment has become more highly politicized, I also, I, I struggle with that a little bit of like, I wanna make sure that everyone that works with me or you know for me in, in our company, that they know that I don't care what their political views are. I value mm -hmm. them 100%. Our, our culture is not about anything mm -hmm. to do with what your politics are. It's, do you come to win? You know, do you find a way to get things done? Do you put your teamwork over ego? What you can, mm -hmm. you come produce results. So I, I do, I feel like I probably moderate how outspoken I am on some things more because of that. Yeah, that's an interesting yeah. dynamic, right? Yeah, it's interesting because the tech community has not been political. You're like the first like tech person that I can really think of who like, I'm going in here. <laughs> I'm going, I'm on. Well, and everyone's time, like, like, what are you doing? Are you sure you do that? <laughs> They're like, are those parties actually that fun? It's like, no, the tech <laughs> parties are more fun. I'll tell you right now. Any tech party is going to be a lot more fun than a political party. And you've gotten really engaged in the Ukraine issue, too. Yeah. And that, of course, is one that is controversial, although I think that there is majority support for, you know, supporting the people of Ukraine. But that's a really deeply personal one for me. And that's why I've stayed really connected to it. And the reason it's so personal is because I lived in the Czech Republic for those couple of years. And then I went back a couple dozen times and I've done business there in that broader region and done nonprofit stuff there. And 
it gives you a whole different perspective when you've spent a lot of time in your life with people. Like I, I have a lot of friends who were there in 1968 in Czechoslovakia, which was the last time that the Kremlin ordered tanks to go into a country and basically shut down mm -hmm. um, their government and say, no, you're not going to do things this way. You're going to do them that way. Yeah. And, and I feel like, unfortunately, the tech community has gotten, I think there's a lot of strands of confusion about what's happening there. And, and you know, I, I, there, there's parts of it that are nuanced, but there's parts of it that are very simple. Mm -hmm. And I was in Kiev not long ago. Well, I, I was getting Have the hypersonic. You met with, what's his name? Met with President Zelensky, Zelensky met with yeah. other yeah. leaders there. And, you know, that was really interesting. And that's the splashy, like, that's, that's so what, crazy. That, 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 it, was, it was crazy. But that, that's what people write about. But honestly, yeah. from that trip, what I remember the most is, like, the grandmas that I was hugging in, in like, Bucha in Irpin, who were telling me about, like, this is a quote from one that said, I hope you never have to experience the evil that we have in our lives. And so I just want to, like, mm. bring home to people that if you're thinking about, like, wait a minute, well, what was the deal with, with NATO and you know, this mm -hmm. or that, like there's all these reasons to, that, that, by the way, Russia itself will put out as propaganda or mm -hmm. others that are sympathetic to them will put out as reasons to uh, obscure the issues. But the reality is there, I talked to our ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. They've already documented over 80,000 war crimes committed there. Yeah. These are like so many people have been killed and so many people have been uh, children abducted. Our, our embassy, has already documented over 10,000 kids abducted. Like, think about that. Like, I'll get, just to bring it home yeah. so it's not a statistic, what would happen in an area that had become occupied is that, you know, someone would come in, they would usually work with a collaborator on the ground because they would try to get somebody then who's like more local to be the influencer, and they'd say, hey, new sheriff's in town. We need to explain what this means to kids. We're going to have them come to a summer camp. It's going to be really cool, though. Like, it's going to be awesome, great snacks. We're going to take mm. care of them. But by the way, if you don't send your kids, you'll lose your parental rights because this is, like, very serious. Mm. And so you get that kind of ultimatum, and then your kids go to the summer camp, and you never see them again. Yeah. Like, that's evil in its, yeah. uh, in its grossest form. The things that are happening are things that we think of from World War II and that kind of thing. And so, yes, we can talk about all kinds of layers of the geopolitics of the area, of anything that one particular party could have done different. But I'm telling you that when one sovereign country goes in and attacks another one and sends all kinds of bombs and missiles and terrorizes them constantly mm -hmm. over that, and they're killing people and they're abducting them, that's evil. And mm -hmm. we don't want to live in a world where... Uh, countries can change borders by force yeah. just because they're nuclear power. And so like all of that, all of that really matters to me. It's personal and, and that can be uncomfortable. I think it's probably uncomfortable for some of my, uh, you know, my investors and others who are like, Hey man, um, don't spend a week in, yeah. Ki in Kiev. Like yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, but you know, I, what I try to help them understand is one, you know, first of all, my focus, first and foremost, and my time and my professional efforts are on Mark. We're trying to build this company, uh -huh. and they're going to be there, and we're taking care of home base first. Like, I remember, of all people, LeBron James would say over and over, like, you got to keep the main thing the main thing. Mm -hmm. Like, the main thing is my business, and that's, that's my responsibility as the CEO. We all choose different ways to give back, and we have to choose, I think, to make the biggest difference, you have to choose a lane that you can build on, that you actually know something about. Like... Early in my career, I got invited to be on some boards. And honestly, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. cool. And then I did nothing. They, mm -hmm. I did nothing, and I wasn't connected to the issue. And it was like after a year, it's like, well, I don't, this is not really working for you or yeah. for me. Yeah. But in that area, it's like, Reminds no. me of my <clears throat> tenure on the Salt Lake Tribune's board. <laughs> oh, what is this? <laughs> what are we doing here? There's a lot to talk about there. Should we get into, <laughs> should we get into the Tribune? <laughs> no, keep going. Keep going. Yeah. No, I don't want to get into <laughs> I would love to get into that. But... Um, no, so that that's an area where I am going to continue to try to make a difference, and 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 so, you know, we have this website called HireUkraineTech.com where we're trying to that's way cool. to help. And we when we talked to President Zelensky, I said, hey, you know who, who I am and what I do in Utah. H how how can I best help you? And he said, we need jobs. We need good jobs because we can get tech jobs here and keep them. We've got generators. We've got internet connection. We have a really skilled workforce. So. We have engineers and you need to let people know they can still work and they're mm -hmm. hungry for work. And then he said, we have these product companies that still need funding like that. They're, they're like where Utah was, you know, 
15 years ago as far as the maturity of the tech ecosystem, investment, and all of that. But they've got, some, they've got some unicorn tech companies. Mm -hmm. They've got some others that are emerging that are really great. So he said, if you can help us connect those to the rest of the world to see what our entrepreneurs are doing, that'd be great. So in conjunction with the Silicon Slope Summit coming up, I mean, we on the September 26th, there's going to be a little showcase event of Ukrainian service companies and product companies. <clears throat> Introduce them to the people in Utah that either could be good customers or investors. And look, again, um, we can't, few of us are going to have the ability to change the course of history, like I would argue President Zelensky has. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a person who actually has changed the course of history through his human courage. And again, he's not a saint, he's not perfect, but he had human courage that changed, changed what happened in that country when he decided to stay and, and not flee. But we can all do something. So that's what I would just say is, you know, choose the thing you're passionate about and then just keep going harder and deeper. And, mm -hmm. and I've been shocked, like in the political world, you show up and you're like, well, if I just keep showing up here, turns out yeah. you can make a difference. Showing up is most of the things. <clears throat> That's but it. I want to explain all the reasons why you're wrong about Ukraine real quick. Do you have 20 minutes? <laughs> let's do it. Let's, <laughs> let's make it three hours. <laughs> I've tried to get some of these people, like some of the people in the tech world that I, I have such a hard time with, like David Sachs says a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and they say it in these podcasts where they have a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and I think that they're fundamentally wrong, like misinformed in, in some th key things. And, and I say that... I, I try to not overstep in areas that it's like, look, no one wants to hear just because you're the CEO of a tech company, you think you know about this or that. But I've spent a long time mm -hmm. very closely connected to the issues of that area because I've lived there. I, I, I have dear friends that I love there and I've studied the history and political trends. And I'm and so like, man, give me a forum. Give me a forum for Sachs or and I know Robert David F. Sachs. Kennedy Jr. Yes, give, get him on the pod and let Do me talk to him about this stuff. Do you remember when um, Zenefit was kicked out of Utah? Yeah. Zenefit's got kicked mm. out of Utah for I don't know what reason. This is actually the first time I met Spencer Cox, by the way, because I wrote like something. Well, this has got to stop happening. And I was like blaming it on Herbert and Cox. I didn't know anything. <laughs> I, didn't yes. even, I think I had to like Google who our governor was. <laughs> I'm like, go to Herbert. What are you doing? I'm like, nicest guy ever. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Anyways, and so we kind of led this charge at Beehive Startups to like get Zenefit. <laughs> By the way, whether that was the right thing, so much of my career is like, I don't know if what we're doing is right. But we're but giving we're it, doing it. Yeah, we're going and hard. We're going all the way to the hoop here. <laughs> and we brought Parker Conrad out to speak at yeah. Stardust. So see, that was like our big keynote at the first event. And he's wearing the Beehive Starts beanie. And we were all like, yeah, F the government. <laughs> like things. It was actually way cool. It was fun. And, um, it, the, and then I got on a call with Spencer Cox. And he's like, yeah, we'll change it. <laughs> yeah, we didn't even know this existed. Calm down, dude. This well, is like the world we live in. That that was what impressed me about him is when I called him up, the first big lengthy conversation we had was basically a rant of mine. And unlike other people who didn't, you know, they were basically looking how to get out of the conversation. He was like, he got it. He was smart. And he said, I, I understand. I agree. And then he said something terrible. He said, and I need your help to fix it. It's yeah. like, oh, well, great. I thought I was just going to complain yeah. and not have to do anything here. But he said, look, I need you to come with me. Let's form a little task force and let's talk to the legislators to help them understand like how come Tesla can't sell. And yeah. you, and you get it was into all these, wrapped up in that Uber you, got kicked out. You get into lifted. these issues of like, oh, well, it turns out actually a big part of this is that cities get their revenue from uh, this tax mechanism that comes from a lot of dealerships and the dealerships then want things to be structured mm. this way. And you start to understand not that you maybe agree with all or every part of it, but there's just more layers to it. And then you need to find a solution, which also often takes more time. But I, I oh thought my he gosh, was great. I fold so quick. Like it's, he's like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, actually, I'm on your side. Zenefit shouldn't be here anymore. Like I'll switch immediately, <laughs> particularly if he's like, I, in, and I need your help. I'm like, no, you got it. You got me. Actually, whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. Do I have to go anywhere? That'd be sweet if I didn't. Anyways, the Zenefit thing, I met, I said, I'd know David Sachs. I met him once. <laughs> I met him through the Zenefit thing. Because um, I believe Parker got ousted um, or was about to get ousted, but David Sachs was the CEO of Zenefits, right? Yeah. And um, we did a bill signing, and mm -hmm. I got invited to the bill signing <laughs> uh, to like bring him back to Utah or something. I have no did idea. Did you get a commemorative pen or something? No, they, they didn't let me up there. <laughs> I was in the audience. 
and I don't know why. Uh, but I got invited to it, but I definitely didn't get the pen. I have gotten a pen in the in the past, yeah. but not um, not this particular time. And anyways, and everyone was like talking about, oh, we're so glad we're here. And then uh, Sax gets up and he thanks me. I'm the only person he thanks. It's like I want to thank Clint thank you to Betts Clint. He delivered from this. Beehive <laughs> Startups, who really took the reins early on. I'm like, ah, oh, cool. I'm like, who's this guy? This is guy's way cool. So I'm a huge fan, and I think he's right about Ukraine, and you're not because at a press conference, how good he was he? To complimented, you? <laughs> he complimented, <laughs> and I shook his hand after. He's very nice, very cordial. Here's the thing I'll say though about the Ukraine thing, and in defense yeah. of him, in reality, which is not a defense of Putin or the whole situation, because the whole situation is awful. We do have really poor leadership in this country, and we have lost trust in every institution so no wonder why he would be distrustful yeah right like that's my only thing for me it comes from a place of like he's patriotic he wants the united states to do well he's not like a pro putin guy he's not like a pro like any of this type of stuff he's just like i don't just i don't trust anyone anymore yeah and i think that's a strong sentiment in this country politically just period like and whether or not it's true or not like whether it could actually just be stopped right now and i don't know it probably isn't Right. But there are some who believe like, hey, Biden could just say, hey, we're not expanding NATO into Ukraine ever. And would that end it or would that have ended it back then? Like, and again, it's yeah. probably no. But like, I don't I don't know that it's um, unfair to not trust that. Does I, that I, make sense? Yeah, like, yeah, like I, these guys I, are I, not I, trustworthy people who have been leading our country. And I'm not talking about parties for sure. Right. But you just look at like the polling of like every major institution in this country yeah, yeah, and how distrusted they are. And you say things that are like true. It's like, hey, how could a sovereign nation attack another sovereign nation and try to change their borders? Well, we did that. <laughs> we did that in my lifetime. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And so there have been times where it's like um, – We've seen too many in recent history, in all of our recently, in Sachs's lifetime, just to use him as an example, because he does yeah. have a huge megaphone, and he is very outspoken on this issue. He's very powerful on this issue. And all sorts and especially of, in our community. So, all sorts of issues, yeah. right? And just like, and I'm not saying he's right or wrong. I don't know. You know, everything yeah. you just said, I didn't even know. <laughs> like, I just want to be clear about that. We're going to have to take 30 minutes now. <laughs> but what I will say is like the... If his default is to distrust those in power because of everything he's seen in his lifetime and everything I've seen in my lifetime is like they've kind of been wrong on every major issue <laughs> and wars in our lifetime, too. Yeah. Right. Like like uh, Iraq. Yeah. Or like we were in Afghanistan for 20 years for some reason. Right. There, there's like all I mean, just yeah. go on and on. In fact, th there's probably a good argument to be made. That we haven't been the obvious good guys in a war since World War II, right? And so, like, maybe Korea, yeah, yeah. But again, like, why are why is it not like, yeah. like, yeah? I mean, I don't know, but there, I don't think the default of like let's distrust these guys and our leadership is the bad is a bad thing. Now, whether or not he's right in his solutions or the thing. That's a whole separate thing. But this distrust needs to get figured out by our leaders because trust becomes so important. As you know, like you could never be CEO of a company if your employees yeah, trust your you and your board yep. to trust you to take them to you know where you're saying you're taking yep. them and you're keeping your promises and you're making agreements and you're keeping agreements and all that type of stuff. And when this country and its leadership, again, both parties, because I don't care at all. I've never been registered anything, which is why I don't take the signature packets. Um, like... They have not done a great job of addressing this issue. It's why, in my opinion, Donald Trump got elected. Because we're like, yeah, we don't trust him either. But he's throwing Molotov cocktails at people we actually hate. And who, when he lies to us, we know he's lying. And he kind of winks at us. And he kind of like tells us, I also know I'm lying. When they lie, they pretend like they're, you know, they're telling the truth. Well, and that is the challenge mm -hmm. that the, like... Leaders in this country, both political and business wise, they need to address the trust deficit they have with the general public or we're just going to always have these things like, no, even if it's a clear cut, like my word, how could someone invade a country 
for all the reasons that you said, which are absolutely right. Like, how dare he do that? And like an obvious war crime, obviously unprovoked, all obviously the wrong thing to do, all that type of stuff. Right. Yeah. But like, we're not there. We got to get the moral authority back in order to use it. Yeah, I think. Points well made. Um, there's a stu- there's a study on trust and in institutions, and it does show how trust is unsurprising to no one. Way down in all our institutions, and the answer to restoring that is typically two things: it's competence and it's good ethics. Mm-hmm. And we've seen a lot of failures in those areas in positions of authority and trust, <clears throat> which does, you know, degrade uh, our society. But I I would go. Back to like that. One one thing that I get worried about in how we shape the future for our country uh, on these issues is that if we, if we, how do we get back the moral authority if we don't recognize what we've done wrong and call it out, mm-hmm. and then call out what others have done? Because otherwise, you end in this this kind of realm that some geopolitical strategists find themselves in, which is like there are they'll say there are no such thing as good guys or bad guys. Mm-hmm. They're all just countries acting in their self-interest. And I'm like, I'm telling you that if you are spending time with people that are, you know, having their entire communities destroyed and their family raped and tortured. Yeah. Like there are good they're guys, the good guys. There's good guys and bad guys in that. And and we need to make sure that we are on the side of the good. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that means, again, accounting for where we've made mistakes, which I think we've got plenty to be clear about well, and then rise useful. to our best selves just like staying on mm. the ukraine topic for example again i'm yeah. like getting political but something i seriously don't yeah. actually care about so don't put comments out and we will get the debate with you and sax because he i'm ready he owes me one ever since i brought Zenefits back to utah <laughs> they would have never gotten that <laughs> they would have never <laughs> they easily would have got it done. i wrote one blog post seriously at it. but um the only thing i'll say is it's not useful on the ukraine situation to have a president whose son was on the board of a Ukrainian company getting yeah. like kickbacks and it happens like during his watch. It's similar to like the Bush family having unfinished business in Iraq. There are like these things like, and again, like maybe there's nothing there, which it seems like there clearly is, but maybe there is nothing there. Just like explain it. D- you cannot dismiss it to yeah. the public as yeah. though like, how dare you even bring that up and expect us to trust you. I d- agreed. And Why that's we where we have a president who doesn't even know where he is or that he is president. And like, we can't say that out loud. Well, that's pretty wild. All of these things are like pretty wild. So l- let me talk about a third path between, you know, I think, I think what's hard is that we quickly kind of run to, to tribes and that's comfortable to be in this space where like, I'll give you for a lot of people who are very supportive of, let's say of Ukraine, and what's happening there. Um, many don't want to talk about the actual real issues of corruption that mm-hmm. exist in Ukraine, which are deep mm-hmm. and significant. And many people who are maybe opposed to further aid in Ukraine or, you know, maybe they're even pro-Russia, but you don't have to be pro-Russia to be like wanting something different to happen in the policy well, of the world. I just want to be clear just for <clears throat> your sake. You don't think Sachs is pro-Russia. Um, I don't think that he is nearly as morally clear as he should be about how wrong it is what Putin is doing. That's the problem I have with that. Okay, Sachs, interesting. Is I think that you have to understand the human toll that is that 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 Putin is responsible for, and that that is not theoretical. And and then just saying like, okay, like I mean, I'm with these Ukrainians. Who, they're 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 people were killed horribly, and oh, and then yeah. to say and then to say, oh. No, just just stop and do, make saying. an agreement. So you have a different perspective of him than I do. I don't see him as like pro Russia or anti Ukraine. I see him as like pro Ukraine, pro Ukraine, anti Russia, anti yeah what the current regime is doing and relating to that conflict. Yeah, so but I, that, I, I, but I would, that's a different thing. Like, but yeah, if you think he's like, I, I would point out wild. a lot of things that he's tweeted or said that yeah, are, yeah, yeah. are, are, are you would follow mi- misguided that, for sure, but. That being said, you know, let us get us in the debate. But what I would say to this third path that I think is would be really interesting to people we're talking about is that, you know, this one side says, hey, look, we just got to support Ukraine. But and we, we won't really talk about corruption. And then a group that's concerned about Ukraine will talk a lot about the corruption there. And the reality is, like, I think both things can be true. And 
and what I wish we were talking about, because this is what the best people in Ukraine want, including President Zelensky, including Mayor Klitschko, who's a longtime mayor of Kiev, is they would say, hey, <clears throat> we need help to defend our freedoms and our lives against Russia. Mm -hmm. But we could actually, we shouldn't condition, I, I don't think we should condition that help on like saying you have to give away, you know, 20% of your country and a whole bunch of your citizens to leave them into these in these horrible conditions that are like World War Two, like right. Nazis knocking on your door to pull you oh, out yeah, and people need to be here and all that. Like we don't say, you know, condition is you give that up, but we say the condition is you continue making progress on corruption. You you take these steps for your procurement and the management of these funds to be done according in compliance, you know, according to the standards of the EU, of NATO. There's like a th there's a third way to me that's like the yeah. rational way that and this is a, a more general statement. But that's that not what's lost. happening. Though. That's not it's not what's and I happening. I think that's probably what he is. It, some and of what he's upset with and people who are questioning it is upset with. In fact, it's like the opposite. <laughs> it's like we call it a democracy, but they canceled elections. We call it a democracy, but we installed their 2014 <laughs> and, and yeah. literally interfered in a presidential election. In, in two th this is like recent history stuff. Yeah, I mean. It's pretty wild. I, I, like we had a president uh, you impeached over Ukraine, the last yeah, one. <laughs> yeah, like uh, this uh, is not a new. Yeah, like it's, this it's, is it's, a very it's, corrupt. It's not country. a new thing, but um, and it's not the, the corruption was what was happening with the guy that was actually in the office in 2014, and all the control that he, that he was being controlled by the Kremlin, and so they had these people that stood out on the square for months. To yeah. protest that he ran on this oh, yeah. platform I mean, this that he is why would, it's hard, right? It's because like, do you want him to controlled by the Kremlin or do you want him controlled by us? <laughs> well, and and there's and, and what I tell you, and that's is, what the world's like. The world's that, like, hey guys. Well, and and there, but there's this moral like, I, what I one thing that I, I feel like happens a lot with my friends who are, um, in particular like the libertarian. By the way, background. how am I doing on the uh, opposing? Am I being a good devil's advocate? Yeah, you're, you're, you're good. I I uh, you know, I, I've got I've got a lot of material, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can get we can get to it. What I was gonna say is like I, I feel like some of my friends who are libertarian or maybe more isolationist in their views will say um, we shouldn't be involved in any of this stuff overseas, and they'll say and look at all the bad things that we've done, and and there are good examples of bad things that we've done and really problematic that you can highlight. And I'm just telling you that is nothing like what Putin has done. Don't yeah. don't make this. I don't think I don't think that. I do think people compare. I think you're exactly they, they right. They say that, that it's morally equivalent, like, and they don't they do see. They do say it's morally equivalent. And, and, they, and they don't see, hey, wait a minute. Like, yes, we have done things wrong. What's the thrust of the U.S.? The U.S. is is like, I mean, we do go back to World War II, to your point. But like. Which the Soviet Union won. Yeah, Soviet Union with like, us. This is like where it's crazy. Yeah, but yeah. they want it. I mean, go watch or read John F. Kennedy's American University speech yeah. about the Russia-Utah relationship. It's probably the speech that got him killed. Yeah. Um, and it's all about like, hey, guys, yeah, we don't agree with socialism. We don't agree with, you know, the way they uh, operate over there. But they lost far more soldiers and land. It's like, I think he says something along the line of imagine... Everything from the East Coast all the way to Chicago burned and ruined. All cities, buildings, talent. That's what the Soviet Union experienced. They lost way more people. And they, we Absolutely. don't win World War II without the Soviet Union. Like, this is we, where we, history we, gets complicated, we, and we, it is something like, oh, we don't. this is weird. My point would be there, though, look what we did in the countries that then we— uh, you know, had in our sphere of influence, let's say. Mm -hmm. oh, look yeah, at what yeah. happened with Japan. Yeah, I want to be clear. I'm not, uh, look, I don't look, like Pope. I don't right, like Pope. <laughs> well, but, the, but what happens is people say, oh, well, yeah, they, they want it. And they say like, oh, well, that's, you know, and, and there's this idea of like, well, that's their system. And it's ethnocentric to say that our system is better. And I say, we will lose what we have and who we are if we don't realize that it, our freedoms actually are precious and they actually matter. And if you look at West Germany versus East Germany. Which one would you have wanted to live in? Which yeah. one do you want to raise your kids in? Mm -hmm. Did you want to raise your kids in Japan as they were as we were helping them recover and what they became, or did you did you want to uh, you know have your kids raised in the Soviet Union? And I'm I telling know, you, this is the funny thing about the history. Like, what are they? What is Japan recovering from? Well, two nuclear yeah, bombs yeah, that exactly. we dropped on them. Yeah, that we probably didn't need to. See, well, that's, another, that's another topic. <laughs> I mean, I, and, I, and I would say I understand. 
I mean, I haven't watched, op, you know, Oppenheimer. No, yet. I mean, I, I don't. I actually know. I just want. I just. I actually just like playing devil's advocate with you. But, but, but I, uh, what I would say, though, I think is, it's more complicated. I don't think it's black and white. I don't think it is. I personally don't think it's like we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, and it's that black and white. I do think they're the bad guys. I yeah. think we have. I. I. I know that there's probably been opportunities for us to uphold agreements we've made, like in 1991, where we said we'll never move NATO an inch, and we've moved it a million times since. So that, but this stuff, the whole NATO thing, I, I, this is where, like, if we had time with Sachs and I to justice, it's like, I, I wholly reject that whole argument about, oh, yeah. I mean, about NATO's expansion. Because what I tell you, if you're those countries, because I know a lot of people there, mm -hmm. do you know why they want to join NATO? And by the way, they have to, Agree got, with their own country yeah, to join NATO because they don't want Russia, which is <laughs> evil as nukes. hell, um, taking Pointing over them. them yeah. Because and not just and I don't just mean that because of the nukes, but because of they want to take full control of the society and pull all the resources out for their benefit, and they don't care about human freedoms. Yeah, they no, they don't yeah. care. And so if you're in those countries, you feel extremely vulnerable because they're right there. And if Russia wanted to be more effective and a better player on the world stage, why don't they create a system that's more attractive that all their neighbors don't feel like we have to be protected from you yeah. because you no, are yeah, going yeah. to ruin the lives of our people? No, all that's fair. I, I just think like I think there is some new. And I, by the way, I'm arguing a position I don't even know. I don't know Sachs's actual position. I just wanted to get you a little bit worked up. Yeah, here. it's good. But um, like there are like things like like, hey, uh, China's about to do uh, the same thing in Taiwan. Yeah. Are we ready for that? There are like consequences to this. Right. There are like um, I mean, this is the biggest nuclear power in the world. More nukes than us. Like the, there are like end of world consequences if we and, if we do and, this wrong. And, and, and so I totally agree. And that's where I don't think that you some people will say like, oh, because you support Ukraine, you're a warmonger. And I'm like, do you think there will be less war if we allow with w without standing up with the free like mm -hmm. nations of the world and stand up to nuclear powers and say, no, you can't just change borders by force because you feel like it. You can't just roll in with your heavy equipment and machinery and take over this other country. Yeah, Be but you get how the rest of the world hears that and says, hypocrite. To, well, not to you, sure. but to the country. To yeah, to the country to say, and give which example do you want to use? Do you want to use Iraq? Do you want to use Afghanistan? You could use any of it, or even like the nuclear power. There's like only one country has used them. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> like and, this and, is where and, it gets, I'm just telling you like from a world perspective, and I know like, I'm a huge American, love the country, all in. Everything you're saying, I m agree with for the most part. But I, I do think there is some nuance in the conversation where, like, hey, sovereign countries shouldn't just invade other sovereign countries and change their borders. And, and, and so, the so world looks at us and they're like, yeah, we've been saying that for years. Uh, yeah. And, and, and what I would say is that's the, you know, this structure that we set up after World War II. And I would argue that. Um, while there are things I certainly think Vietnam was totally misguided and, and a mistake in so many ways, and Iraq was, and I think I actually think a misguided mission in Afghanistan, those are not the same thing as what Russia is doing in Ukraine. And I would yeah. say, and, no, and, yeah, I would say and, and I would say like, yeah, they're not equivalent. Like, like clouding that is maybe they're not equivalent. I don't know. It, well, I, the I, world I, thinks they're equivalent. I think it's easy to make the argument they're equivalent, and I would say they are not. Like I would think objectively, if you look at it and you understand what that, what actually happened there. They are they are not. And we're you know, and there, that doesn't mean that they were right or well done, but I'm or that I agree with so many of those parts. Right. But I'm saying what what Russia is doing is very, very fundamentally different. And yeah. and, and that's that's the nuance that I think gets lost because it's easy to make a superficial point and, and it lands. It lands for a lot of people. I, I, I don't think you're wrong with reading well, the I sentiment it's fair. of the world. I mean he took Crimea and he still has Crimea. It's not yeah. uh, I mean we're um, you know, yeah. the world would say, well, you guys still have parts of Iraq. You guys, the world would say, well, you guys still have parts of Afghanistan. Yeah. But I do, don't think it's the same. It, it's I very don't different. The they same. come in and they rule as an authoritarian. Yeah. Yeah, and and yeah. you look at what happens with the lives of people there. And, yeah, like we have blemishes that are super embarrassing for us, like Abu Ghari, if I'm saying it right, like the, yeah, yeah. these issues of bad behavior and and horrible tragedies of civilian yeah. casualties and that kind of thing. But what happens in our system that's different than that? Like, 
there's much more of like being held to account. Do you think anything is happening? The people that were going to Bucha and Irpin in Russia, they got awards when they went back there. There's a cultural element that is fundamentally different that this is being celebrated. That right. that that like and 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 it's it's very very problematic. We haven't seen this on a world stage with a country with that kind of power since World War II that, that yeah. has been expanding outside of their borders with it. And, and yeah, I, it's scary. And it's I would say, and, and like, we don't want that future for our kids. I'm, yeah. I, I have spent too much time with people who have suffered under those types of leaders and like the lack of freedom where they're constantly surveilled. I mean, mm -hmm. during in Czechoslovakia, during the area era of communism, one in three people were reporting to the secret police. What kind of society do you have when everybody around you yeah. is reporting? I mean, another thing that they would do is. No, they, yeah, but, you know, like. What people would say back to that is, is like, we're also being constantly surveilled. Yeah. And, 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 and that's why we got to find it. COVID. We were reporting on each other. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and but, yeah, I would, but, but again, I would there say, are is degrees, the and is it the same? No, and, and, and it's probably and not. The it, same. It's 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 not, yeah, and yeah. I, and that's the thing that like is, I value people who, we got to protect our freedoms and our right to privacy. Like I think if we were to rewrite, you know, we were to say we have rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and I say privacy yeah. is another one, and we got a lot of work yeah. to do on that. But I think we got an environment where in the the best system, if we can keep it, that. Um, in, in man's relation to man to like continue to perfect yeah. and get to a more perfect union. And then you got systems that aren't trying and don't care yep. and don't value that at all. And the end results are horrible on a human level. For sure. Yeah. And Communist and socialism societies are awful. They, they don't, they don't it's terrible. work. I mean, yeah. I was just, you know, doing a little a deeper dive study on um, the era of Mao in China and, and how, how many people, just just died from starvation and but it's then there's not an environment where there where that can be talked about right that's all mm -hmm. that's all covered up and you know whether you say that with Mao or with Stalin and so I'm I'm really allergic as you can tell from the conversation oh, yeah. about about like moral, moral equivalence equivalency. and more equivalencies that's when right. when there well, that doesn't take away from all the things that we shouldn't be doing or that are bad or that are wrong um, but like how many you know uh, Look, look, and I, and I mean, like, by the way, you can, then then someone will come and, and if they review this, they'll talk about it and say, look at these horrible things that's, that happened in Vietnam. And I would say, yes, you're right. We should acknowledge that. We should never let that happen again. Like you said, we should take the moral authority back and say, that's not who we are at our best. And we right. and, and, and then this is who we're going to be. But it doesn't help us in the position we're in to say, well, because we've done that and it would be hypocritical, then we can't say anything. No, while I think, Russia, I think you know, we need to say stuff. I think you're yeah. I, I think everything you just said is right. The only thing that I would add, and it's not a but, it's an yeah. and is like it's not useful that we have a president who has this Ukrainian corruption stuff hanging over his head. It's not useful that this is the person who we're trying to I, get I, moral authority by. I, I, I when, would you know, agree like fully. That it, it's really problematic That's really weird. and it's hard. And by the way, the yeah. other guy like had his own issues in the opposite way. And so like that that's where it gets really hard. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think my sense of it, you followed the Sax's argument, but and I don't even know why I'm defending on it. He said one well, nice thing. He, he, he did say one nice guy. thing. He did say one nice thing about me. And by the way, he had a That's great fine. he has a great sample deck for a board deck for a tech company. I use it all the time. And I think uh, he's a genius. He's he's, he's a genius. He's tech really, guy. really bright in the business world. So. Well, he's a genius product guy. He's a genius yeah. software he's probably the best software as a service guy. Uh if well, probably Parker Conrad and those two hate each other, which is really funny that it's that it's those two. And uh, he's a great investor, right? I yeah. mean, I didn't even know he was political. Did you until like the no? Past it few just years? always kind of come up yeah. with the. Yeah. What do you think of those guys? Actually, that would be an interesting way for us yeah. to end. Like, like what they've they've figured out how to do, and I'm talking specifically about like the All In podcast and really just Silicon yeah. Valley in general. What they've figured out how to what to do that we haven't is one have conversations like this, yeah, which I think is like this might be the first one ever in Utah Tech. And you need you need a better like opponent <laughs> over here because I actually don't know anything. And well, then, I'm sure a lot of people listening will will take issue with things I've said, and I welcome it. That's that's fine. That like you know let's let's uh, get the okay. conversation going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's why this thing exists. We're a nonprofit. We don't have to make money. That's it's right. impossible to like. What do you want? <laughs> uh, right. And so um, let let me ask you though. Like 
I, I do think it's interesting the influence of things like the All In podcast, the influence yeah. of Mark Andreessen, Ben Horowitz, the influence, maybe the most influential person in the world of Elon Musk, the influence of Peter Thiel, all these all these yeah. tech, uh, very, very successful. And whether they've done it the right way or not, or we agree with them or not, is kind of irrelevant to me. Why do you think Utah, who has as successful entrepreneurs and coming up on as successful of a tech history, not yet, but um, why yeah. do you think we haven't been engaged in that arena? Yeah, I think we got a long ways to go. Because you are, be that, uh, but you are an anomaly in our community. Yeah. It seems to me in Silicon Valley, I could find, you know, the pro Ukraine, pro Russia, and they would both have like not pro. I keep saying pro Russia. I don't but, think anyone's pro Russia. Uh, there's but not maybe. much of that. Yeah, there's, but, uh, there's, there's like a there's a yeah. there's a sub segment of that, but it's mostly. Do something different, yeah. not give support. And I think yeah. a lot of it comes from a good intention, real quick. Of like, hey, I just don't like war. And I'm like, I hate war. I don't want more war. But you don't By always. The way, one of our senators holds this view. Mike Lee, I think, is in this camp. I, 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 I've got a lot of issues with the way that he talks about this. <laughs> and I'd love, to, I'd love for him to go to keep and meet yeah. with um, President Zelensky. But my, my point is like bringing it back just to our community yeah. and the importance of these conversations and the important, importance or non importance, if we decide. Um, of our community having these conversations and getting in these debates. Why do you think we have it and do you think we should? I think we should because I, I think um, if not, there's a vacuum that's filled by other voices. And I, and I, what I would say is, and, and there maybe is a little bit of arrogance in this, but I think Utah has a unique perspective. I think that there's something special mm -hmm. about the way that our business community works, about the, the way that our um, the way that we interact with the public sector. And I think that that's seen in results that are often touted like fastest growing state and, mm -hmm. you know, best place to do business and all these things. Like, I think that there's there, this this gets um, beat down very hard, especially by anybody who's experiencing negative parts of our state. But this but I believe in this concept of the Utah way. Again, mm -hmm. there's a lot of examples that are counter examples to that. But what at our best, we actually do bring people together. And I'll give you an example of that that happened here when the Silicon, ba Silicon Valley Bank mm -hmm. situation was going down. Oh, like, for sure. Like how remarkable was it that and, and people don't even really understand because the way that it happened where Silicon Valley Bank is failing tons of how many hundreds of utah companies oh yeah were were at totally at risk of having any funds to be able to draw and just because they had their money and one of the most secure banks in the country by any mm -hmm. number of metrics it was, it was a crazy time and what happened in the state of utah is there was enough of this connective tissue that um the business community and the political community got together and over a weekend formulated a plan that said here's a backstop that was that was a private market solution in so many ways because we had banks mm -hmm. involved and basically companies were going to be able to get access to funds to continue operating so that their business didn't fall apart. Like I don't think that story has been told because we didn't need to do it. Yeah. But the truth is all Utah companies would have been safe regardless of the Fed's decision because of that weekend. It, and that is remarkable. It's incredible. Yeah. And that that's what remarkable. I'd say is like, I don't think that people are hearing about that the Utah story, the best versions of the Utah way, like they could be. And to your point, there's a void of leadership on the national level and in other capacities. We we need voices. I guess I would say sincere voices that uh, that care about like humanity, goodness, mm -hmm. and take your take your your spin on how you think that'd be best, or you know, like in any of these issues. But I think Utah has a perspective, and I worry that. Like there's there's a silo there. Like I can't tell you how many people in the tech community will say like, "Hey, did you hear what happened on the All In podcast?" I had to send out some emails really? to people. I had to send out people. I had to send some emails out to people to say like, "Hey, like I know there's things to like about RFK Jr. And by the way, a lot of Bobby Kennedy stuff. His dad's mm -hmm. was very influential to me, and JFK stuff very influential to me. But I'm like, some of this stuff is like just wrong. Right. But it because of the format that it was. Um, put forward on there and you know it was widely like uh, influential in the Utah tech community and and okay that's all right let's just have more of a marketplace of ideas yeah where there's like a Utah voice Utah perspective because by the way we're also playing on an international stage and mm -hmm. like that's that's another thing that struck me I remember um, you know we, we go back to Ryan Smith and Utah Jazz like 
This is a this is an international platform. Mm-hmm. I was in the Middle East and I was checking the newspapers uh, every day to just see does anything about Utah come up. You know, every day they talked about the Utah Jazz. Yeah, it's the front door to Utah. That's right. So you, we we have all these ties in our community to um, platforms that matter, and I think let's let's find ways to you know lift our voices up to do good. And and I think that if we're all trying to do that, even where we might disagree, and even if I need to d- debate Sachs on the details. I think that Utah That'd can be cool. make a difference. I actually think we could give that a real go. Yeah. I wonder if we could uh, get him to do that. He's a big name now. I'm He's game. really famous now. I'm, I'm game. I'm not really famous. We need to up your profile. Yeah, too. yeah. I, 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 you know, uh, follow me on no, um, okay. threads. No, I'm kidding. I I'm not on there. I'm not on there. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm on threads. I, I get, think threads I gotta get is threading. great. Yeah, who cares? Yeah, oh, I, I, I don't have that profile, but there are people who do, and... I, I worry about... No, we should have these... Con- I like the idea of Utah being in these conversations. Do I really care? Because I think like even like the RFK thing, I may disagree with you a little bit, or maybe I misunderstood you. Like I'm fine with them having him on and giving... Like I don't care about any of that, or I don't even really care. To, like as long as like, um, you know, the opposite is hurt too. Because I think we're adults. I think the thing that, again, that I think leaders are maybe missing or just dismissing or they... Uh, you know, or not doing in a way that maybe we used to do is like just being like, no, actually, we're just not even going to talk about those things. Yeah. Right. That's the thing that I think we need to be like on the Ukraine stuff. Like, I feel like all of what you just said could be addressed and probably has great answers or everything that I said that pushed yeah, back yeah, yeah. Could, probably could be addressed and has great answers. But the response is, no, we don't even talk about those. Things. That's right. And, and that's where we need to, I think leadership needs to come. It's like, no, we're actually going to lay out exactly what happened um, in 2014, we're going to lay out why we didn't do anything when he took Crimea. We're going to lay out what the conversations actually were about NATO. These pre- are all the things I want to talk about. Yeah. You know, like yeah. we're going to lay up, lay out like how much money, if any, if, if at all, yeah. Hunter Biden got from Ukraine. And if he did, what does that mean about the first impeachment? Like there's like weird things. Right. But it's like somebody like I don't like but I can understand and I wish leaders could understand like, hey, you can't like if, if these questions go unanswered, the assumption is whew, there's a lot of fire over there. So so here's a challenge that I don't have an answer to, but I'd posit to you on this that is tough. And that is, I think a lot of people who are looking to win an argument are willing to put out things that are are not moored in mm-hmm. any sort of like yep, factual basis. Sure. And it's much harder to refute that mm-hmm. with facts. Like that's what's hard is I think one of the reasons people don't have those conversations is it's like, well, you know, no, we shouldn't have these. Con- that's what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, like our yeah. leaders should have these conversations. Like, that's right. Like if we had great leaders. Yeah. Like the leader who's being accused of getting tens of million dollars from Ukraine and somehow is like worth millions and millions of dollars. And he's been senator since he's 35 years old. Should just answer how that happened. And that's it. And, and, and I'm sure there's a good explanation. There's not. I'm actually not sure. There's a good, like, how is Nancy Pelosi worth so much money? Like, how is she, like, better at trading than Warren Buffett? There are, like, things that the general country I would think just like to some say, answers hey, to. We, we don't feel like it's a fair game or getting good answers to. And I think that's right. And I think that I think you're right reading that sentiment in in the country. And I, I Mitt Romney said recently something that I um, have thought a lot about. He said, I worry that the only thing that can change the direction we're headed is some horrific event because mm-hmm. that sometimes pulls us together. And, and I'm paraphrasing here or that we have a leader emerge that's like of the caliber of a Churchill or a Lincoln that can bring us back to a better place. And and he said, I don't see any of those as likely right now. And that's that's a bit of a, a down note. Yeah, but we've I, but got I, to be careful. Our leaders have got to be careful. Because these conversations are great. I even think the All In podcast is great. I mean, I know we're talking like they're influential and they're like a top podcast. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter at all if if our leaders would just stand up and like, hey, it's obvious what's trending on social media every day. It's obvious why like rich men of north of Richmond is trending number one. Like we see all of this. And hey, why don't we just like address it for you guys? Right? Yeah. And I think the longer you go, and by the way, I think like even put our leaders aside and talk about our refs who have like the lowest yeah of rural, like in the single digits in the media like if everybody's not trusted all at once i can see why this happens and i'm not saying it's right or people are you know um right in their you know the way they dis- or the way they characterize the ukraine situation because of all or whatever the name the situation 
but I can't you just see like how it happened? Like to me, it like makes total sense when like, hey, I just want to look at everything that's happened in my lifetime. I want to look at like who these players are because it's the exact yeah. same players. <laughs> you know, Joe Biden's been in the national conversation my entire life and before I was born, and yep. and same with Trump, and same with. Romney's his dad was a yeah. front runner for president until he said he was brainwashed in Vietnam. Like all of this stuff is like and pretty. Do you, do you remember what the what then the real cutting remark was after? Is one of the other people said, um, "Why a brainwash when a light rinse will do?" And that was the <laughs> the slam. That, that was the big scandal. really hurt. Yeah, <laughs> that was the big scandal back yeah. in the day. Randy, by the way, he was right. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Mitt, right. Mitt's dad was right. That's the sad thing, and that's <laughs> that's what's tough about some of these issues. By is, the way, Mitt was right about Russia. Yeah, when he said it's the number one it's geopolitical crazy. foe, and and a lot of times the scorekeeping doesn't happen in real time. That's another thing that I think about, and and why, you know, I hope that when we have conversations about things like Ukraine or others, that we can be like stay in a like productive, persuasive zone because. It is har harder sometimes in real time to see what's happening. Like I go back and I study a lot about World War II. You know, there were a lot of people who were quite pro-Hitler in the States. For sure. You know? Oh, and, absolutely. And, and e even like in Utah, people are like, man, this guy, he says no drinking. <laughs> yeah, we, we like what we're hearing. <laughs> and and they, they, they didn't have all, all the context, obviously, yeah. and they, they couldn't see how it was going. But there were definitely indicators that should have said, hey, this is, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're in red flag territory. Literally and figuratively. Well, we got in late. That's why Soviet Union won that thing. Yeah. Like, we got in pretty dang late. Yep. Um, anyways. Uh, so so what I would say, though, is, yes, I want Utah to have uh, in influence, and I want us to have more spaces where we can have conversations and, and where we can model good conversations. Um, that was my main critique about RFK Jr. on the All In podcast, as I don't feel like they presented mm -hmm. much of the other side of the view. And I think... If we that that's helpful in really influential platforms, right. it, is is get, allow the, allow the things to be said and allow the back and forth, um, and see where it takes us. What we need to do is create our own all in podcast. That's what we've there learned you here. You need to, we need to do a weekly show. Well, and we if need we, get if we could other... find some people who could you know articulate these things well. Let's let's okay. bring them let's, on. Let's, let's take put our place. the invitation <laughs> yeah, out there. Who right. wants to join us? Yeah for a uh, weekly show where we talk about national that actually would be fun this was fun well it is, it's fun for me i really care about it i do acknowledge that one that's one of the things that's tough is i think a, a critique of tech leaders is like and any leader who's had some success in some realm is like well now you think you know everything and i certainly know that i don't the reason that I'm willing to speak up on the Ukraine thing is I've spent a lot of time on it. Yeah, yeah. You, you know? You're passionate about it. You've been there. Yeah. I mean, how many people have been there? It, right? it does you change your perspective when you're, when you're in a bunker as you're getting a hypersonic oh, yeah. missile sent at you. And well, I love you, brother. I, I always have. Um, and I love what you're doing with Mark and your whole career is phenomenal. And you've been an inspirational leader. And just the fact that you have the courage, and I mean this sincerely, to step into an arena like politics where it's pretty thankless as you know um and and kind of mostly just downside yeah but because you want to be heard and the fact that you are really i think leading and in sometimes even dragging our community into this conversation because it needs to happen is very admirable and i thank you for it uh that's kind of you to to see the best of what i'm trying to do and give me more credit than i deserve but Back at you. I no, want to see. That's how I experience I it. Yeah. Love you too, man. And Bet's um, 28. You know, that's what I like to do is I like to find people By who way, can um, I for just, something. in this conversation alone, <laughs> made myself completely <laughs> unelectable. I think we've just got by plenty, spewing plenty, bullshit. plenty of examples <laughs> of people in uh, prominent races that would suggest otherwise. That's uh, true. But what, what I would say is like, I, they're, it's worth it. Just like a. a, a, a if you if people feel passionate around this, I would say show up and get involved. And the reason that I say we do it is any, you know, at any era of time, there's going to be different businesses that are rising and falling. But but right now we got one state, we got one country. Mm -hmm. So um, let's do a show. Uh, reach out, everyone watching this or listening to us, and tell us who the four people should be. And Silicon Salt will host it right here every single week. It'll be great. Done. Uh, let's do it. Let's get Sachs on there. And do a debate. I'll reach out to Sachs. I actually will reach out to Sachs today, and he won't read my email, and that'll be the end of that. <laughs> but you're going to tell him, <laughs> be Hive Startups. Hey, remember me? You said my <laughs> name once. All right. Thanks, All brother. Right, Thank you.